Hey, everybody. Uh, today, I'm here with Neil Teese, uh, author of Notes on Complexity, a really wonderful book. Uh, and he had sent it to me uh, maybe a year ago or something when it first came out. And I was sluggish and I didn't get around to it and finally did. And I was super delighted when I understood what he's talking about. Um, of course, for anybody watching this, if uh, they like this content, if they could please uh, subscribe to the um, channel, uh, like the, the podcast and all those nice things would be helpful. Uh, they might also want to check out my newsletter, which is danielpinchbeck.substack.com. Uh, and uh, great. I read every one. Oh, really? That's great. Oh, that's yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> that's very cool. I'm a fan. That's so cool. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I we met originally. Um, I don't remember how. Uh, someone else. I'm wondering if it was Michael Garfield, um, or someone else. Uh, had a little panel. Yeah. Downtown East Villagey, and um, was it Bill Ottman from Mindstock? Yes, yes, that's it. Yeah. And um, that, and I think the video exists online. Actually. Oh, cool! Good night. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so Neil, congratulations on the book. And it, it feels Thank like you. it's like kind of has a real life out there. Like I was just at McNally um, Bookstore in New York, which is the best bookstore in the city, and they had it on the bestseller uh, table. So yep. you, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's it's gone into its third printing in hardcover which kind of blows me away. Uh, paperback's coming out in the fall. And um, and yeah, it's getting around. You know, there wasn't a big promotional campaign um, for this. Spiegel and Brown, my publisher, uh, they have a long history as one of the most important uh, imprints at Random House. But when Random House merged with Penguin, uh, part of that deal was to throw them out. Um, so they went independent. I'm the second book they acquired. I, I think the fifth one to actually come out. So there wasn't a huge budget for promotional stuff. It's really been moving on its own steam. Uh, some podcasts help, some big ones, but people seem to give it to each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe just tell us a little bit. We were just talking about it a moment ago. But what, what, what's sort of the genesis of the book? Like how did it uh, emerge out of the ether? Yeah, so... Um, it feels very much like it emerged out of the ether in pieces over the last 30 years or so. Um, I started giving public talks about this stuff, which is basically, it's the same framework. It's just broadened and deepened as, as the last two decades have gone by um, about 20 years ago. And um, it came about because I was put together with an artist named Jane Prophet, who's a, um, an artist back then in the UK. Now she's in the US. And um, she had, uh, we had a mutual friend who got a grant to have us do an interdisciplinary thing, a scientist talking with an artist. And all we had to do was record our conversation so other people could look at it. And I was describing to her what um, the first science thing I did that kind of went viral was adult stem cell plasticity, that bone marrow stem cells in humans moved around the body and could become part of any organ. Uh, unintended consequences that led to George, that paper led to George Bush's address to the nation on stem cells, which was an unfortunate thing. But so that happened. <laughs> um, and uh, I became very um, popular for a nanosecond with fundamentalist anti-abortion groups in the United States. Um, but um, then they found out who I was, <laughs> not so much. Um, so I was telling Jane about um, how cells are moving around the body like this. And, and she said, well, that's very much how complexity scientists talk about slime molds and how ant colonies organize themselves. And I'd never heard of complexity theory. So she explained it to me. And we started exploring. Um, we brought on a mathematician uh, and a computational scientist and started modeling stem cells according to complex systems theory, um, published some papers on that. But the implications of it just kept sort of unfurling. And um, uh, and that eventually within a year and a half uh, turned into this sort of grand scheme that I present in the book. And uh, what was interesting, the first time I gave the talk, it was actually at my Zen group, uh, the Village Zendo, in New I often try stuff out there because they're really smart 
diverse people. Um, and it went over very well. Um, then I started doing it for academic stem cell biologists who would often sit there like this and with their legs crossed. But uh, not too keen initially, but by the end, um, I had taken them places they didn't expect. And the questions were always very interesting and came in from all sides, um, presented it. My nephew wanted me to come to his fifth grade class. Uh, and so they brought me in to give a talk to the two. Uh, this was Solomon Schefter in Queens. And uh, teachers wound up calling the parents to tell them they were holding the school buses because I did with questions. And I didn't change the talk the for the different audiences. It's simple, and it, it was exactly the same stuff. And over the years, there's just been this tremendous response to it. Um, I didn't really want to write this book um, because I thought to do complexity theory justice, uh, what I was thinking in my head was a, a book like Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe three or 400 pages annotated and I'm not that person and I don't yeah. certainly don't have the time I'm a diagnostic pathologist I have clinical work to do and um and my agent said no 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 no. just turn your talk into a little book I think uh she suggested Ravelli's uh seven brief lessons in physics as a model and I thought oh that I can do and um it Turned out to be pretty hard because I'm a science writer. I write science papers. I don't write for a general public, so I had to learn how to do that. Um, but it seems I've managed to. Yeah. What do you feel is like the uh, the salient like piece of, of new information or kind of the, 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 the cutting edge of what it is that you're putting out there that is both exciting to people and which maybe people who are more like traditional science people might feel uh, a certain level of resistance to? Uh. It's funny, I was uh, participating in a, um, no, I don't have to answer that, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I'm in my hospital office and I'm not going. <laughs> um, so that, on the one hand, that's a hard question to answer because um, unlike my academic talks, like if I talk about stem cells or if I talk about liver pathology, which is my subspecialty, I'll give a talk and there, you know, and I'm sure you feel you have the same sort of experience. You're going to tell a story about your topic and everyone comes with you at the same time, get to the same spot and come to your conclusion. And it's sort of a uniform thing. When I've given this talk, um, it never fails to be more like light bulbs going on across the world. Um, at every single slide, at every single statement I make, there's something for someone in the room. I can't predict who that's going to be, and I can't predict what it is that's hitting them. So everyone who reads the book comes at me with completely different things. And the result is the response I'm getting to the book. I kind of thought this would happen because of the talks, but um, I get letters from artists. Um, it's already been used in an installation in a museum in Oslo. Um, someone's doing choreography based on it in L.A. Um, in two weeks, I'm going to a conference they're holding to discuss the book with me. The Jungian analysts of Rome want to talk to me about it. Um, I'm doing a thing with sustainability in the fall. Um, so, you know, and, and a few science people too. I think what you're probably most interested in, <laughs> my guess, would be that... Um, what complexity theory did for me, first of all, was give me a way to understand how all levels of the universe exist in an interrelated form from the quantum, from space time on up. Um, the problem is that even with a comprehensive model like that, that spans the quantum world to the relativistic world, including all of life. And complexity theory is really a, a way of understanding life, where life comes from, how life develops, how it evolves. And, um, but I couldn't say anything about consciousness, although many people had used complexity to explain consciousness. Uh, one example would be um, uh, Douglas Hofstetter in uh, Gödel Escher Bach, famously, 
um, talked about how the structures of the brain um, self-organize themselves to give rise to human mind. And so the brain makes mind and the, the mind is an emergent property of the self-organizing system of everything in the brain. And that's one of the things about complexity. It talks about how interrelating uh, individuals that fulfill certain criteria give rise to larger scale structures that often appear planned, like the, the you know, where a food line goes with the ants or the organization of people walking down a sidewalk or driving on a highway, um, neighborhoods, cultures, ecosystems. We see larger scale structures and they're happening because of, of complexity. Um, the problem is that that's not a satisfying answer to where consciousness comes from because we run up against the hard problem of consciousness, and which is that nothing we can measure in the brain explains the experience of the phenomena that are being that are being experienced. So um, we can say everything about you know the classic red rose. A photon comes into the eye, hits the retina, goes up the nerve, visual cortex, and you see a rose. But if you close your eyes, you can see a rose too. You don't need that. The experience of seeing a rose is independent of the neuronal pathways. Um, that's why cognitive neuroscientists, I think it's very frustrating to them, always have to say when they find something that correlates with a phenomenon in the mind, they have to say it's a neural correlate of consciousness because they can't ever prove that it caused it. So that's been a persistent problem for them. Some people have addressed the problem by saying, well, consciousness is inherent in smaller aspects of the world that self-organize themselves in a complex way into the consciousness we experience as humans. This is the so, pen idea. Pardon? That's the panpsychist. Kind That's of the panpsychism view. And I was a panpsychist for a little while because, of, I mean, it seemed to make sense. And um, I became familiar with the work of Francisco Varela, autopoetic theory, where cells are the basic unit of life. And in his definition, cells have mind. Anything living has mind. Um, anything that has mind is alive. And in fact, he was a student of the Dalai Lama and the Mind and Life organization that organized for several decades, meetings between scientists and the Dalai Lama was, uh, Varela founded that um, and called it mind and life because of this idea that mind and life went together. And the smallest unit of life is the cell. And so cells have mind and cells organize themselves into larger structures, which have larger, more complex minds until you get to our brain, which has the most complex. Um, there are people who say that there are particles that convey consciousness. I think Christoph Koch is uh, talking about that now. There are people who say, well, it's elements of the structure of space-time that have some formational consciousness. Um, this would be Stu Hameroff and uh, Sir Roger Penrose. But they don't explain away the hard problem. You still have the same issue. And so where I finally landed, prodded in part by my collaborator and all the consciousness stuff, Minas Kafatos, is that an idealist point of view. Um, and I know you quote Bernardo Castro quite a lot. Um, he's a pal. Um, I'm in awe of how he manages to do this philosophically um, the way he does. But we land in exactly the same place, which is that there is an underlying big C consciousness, I call it in the book. We don't have enough words in English to describe these things. And it's the nature of that big C consciousness to be non-dual. Um, there's no subject object split within it. And um, it's indescribable mathematically, poetically, visually, you name it. And out of that springs the universe. And um, so the book explores that as the final option and gives a coherent idea of why that would lead to space-time, quantum foam, quantum particles, atoms, molecules, and the whole shebang. So, And why is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, so Minas and I, we had four, our, our, we both have had contemplative, uh, contemplative paths. 
Um, for me, uh, the primary one has been Zen Buddhism. Um, I have a working, pretty strong academic understanding of Jewish mysticism. For Menas, Advaita Vedanta, he had a pretty good academic uh, idea of, of a version of Hinduism. Um, but he was a, a practitioner of Kashmiri Shaivism. And I, we go into those four um, areas to see what they have to say about the underlying stream of consciousness that seems to um, underlie reality. And we wrote about that in some academic papers, but I summarize it in the book. And each one, mystical traditions tend to focus on a particular question they're trying to answer. So they're interrogating the same phenomenon, but they often perceive different aspects of it. So in Buddhism, the question is, how do you end suffering? And so um, there it's by directly experiencing the mind of clear light, the mind stream that underlies existence through which all dualities disappear. And when you experience that, suffering disappears because everything is a single connected thing. Jewish mysticism, the question is, uh, how was the world created and how is it created in each moment? And so how existence arises from that becomes a question. Um, Four Worlds Kabbalah talks about that in detail. But how that actually happens, the mechanics, which is your question, uh, Kashmiri Shaivism, is, that was their question. How do you get the world of duality from non-duality? What's the transition between those lines? And when they drill down contemplatively, these weren't, you know, they were sitting around imagining things. These were things they use their minds to explore and prod until they had a direct experience of it. That fundamental pure awareness, awareness of awareness, no subject object split, for some reason has an urge that it wants to know itself. And in doing so, has to start to conceive of the possibility of there being a subject and object. And they discuss the stages whereby the idea occurs, and then there's sort of a shimmering awareness that there's possibility of separation. Um, step five is the actual separation into subject and object. To get separation, separation can only be measured in dimensions, like space and time and maybe some other dimensions. So the moment you get subject objects uh, separation arising out of the non-dual, you wind up with dimensions, which gives you space-time. And space-time is an energy-rich field, and that gives you the quantum foam, and that gives you the quantum particles, and gives you the entire universe. So the universe, so the fundamental big C consciousness trying to understand itself gives rise to all of this. Wait, wait, how did, you, how did we get from that uh, pure um, awareness to the quantum foam? So the the... The separation into subject object, separation requires dimensionality. Okay. If there's no dimensions, you can't have separation. Yeah. Um, separation in which dimensions? Well, the only ones we're really confident about are space and time. Okay. But once you have those, you have space time. And once you have space time, according to quantum theory, you have an energy rich field, okay. which then gives rise to mass containing particles because of E equals MC squared. And they usually self-annihilate because they're matter-antimatter pairings, but sometimes they don't. And when they don't, they get to interact with each other like members of a complex system. And they give rise to larger subatomic particles, which give rise like a complex system to atoms, which give rise to molecules, which give rise to all existence. This is kind of like a um, a level beneath, let's say, you know, the, anything of the physical universe. Mm -hmm. like this would be like pre-Big Bang. Maybe there's many Big Bangs, or you know, maybe that's just a misinterpretation of what actually happened. Uh, um, well, the thing is that in the non-dual, there's no time. Yeah. There's no dimensionality. So uh, you, the, the, the idea of a Big Bang is kind of meaningless if there's no time and no space. Yeah, but, what, but that, it still could be just as the same way like a seed sprouts and creates a flower. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it could be that there was something that created this particular universe, like some kind of... Well, and that thing we would say, and all these traditions would say, 
is that fundamental awareness. That's the fundamental thing that gives rise to everything else. There is nothing separate from it because it is the source of all things. It's the ground of being. Um, I'm looking over here because I'm using a quote in a talk that This is a Sufi master named Hazrat Anayat Khan. Um, and he said, this regards, uh, you know, your mentioning of the seed. The Sufi says this whole universe was made in order that God might know himself. Pardon the gender specification. The seed wished to realize what it is, what is in it, and therefore became the tree. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's exactly what it's like. Your metaphor is kind of spot on. Yeah, no, very cool. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a very enjoyable book. It's very soothing in a way to think that everything like, you know, kind of maybe fits together. Uh, I liked where you talk about um, kind of, um, you know, the failure to create the theory of everything, you know, kind of. Um, um, and um, yeah, you don't have an exact reconciliation on a mathematical level, but you're saying that's not the only level there is, that it's also kind of like well, this. Well, actually, actually, um, I, I there's a footnote somewhere in the book um, you can't mathematically describe non-duality. So, you know, there's just, yeah. there's no way to get there. You can experience it directly, but you can't describe it. However, what's happening at those earliest stages of creation, that can be mathematically described. And if you look at the further reading in the book, in the back, there are a couple of papers where we have mathematical uh, ways of approaching this. Um, one using T-Topos theory, um uh now i'm going to block on it the math is not my strong suit yeah so i was on the math team so i seem to have an instinct for it and oh, uh, I I, i'm a co-author on all the papers these are with manas and a guy in california named goro kato yeah and i was of course also very happy you know first of all that you arrived at the idealist uh view uh which i also you know share but then also that you said hey wait a second like if this is the reality then all these areas of uh, paranormal investigation, kind of like supernatural uh, psychic phenomena, the, 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 these could be very uh, legitimate. Do you want to explain how you make that uh, that leap or what 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 happened there? <laughs> yeah, well, um, so the actual history of this book is I wanted to write a different book and no one would publish it unless I wrote this book first. Um, that book was a report of my mom's last eight years, during which she needed 24-hour home care. She lived next to us on the Lower East Side um, and uh, started having experiences of dead people. Um, they started bringing in more dead people. They started telling her things she couldn't possibly have known because she was never on the phone because she was deaf and couldn't leave the apartment. And um, and then spirit guides from the universe started showing up. I have a shamanic teacher. She met him on the astral plane, um, which I found out about because she told me and she never had met him before. I met him actually several years after she had started to decline, decline. Um, she started having uh, spontaneous awakening experiences and she died in a bliss bubble. And I wanted to write that book. In my Jewish family culture, the idea of talking to dead people is not a big surprise. The idea that visions can happen in dreams that have meaning is not a big surprise. So on the one hand, I could go into this book and say, I'm going to build a model that contains all these other things. But the impulse to do it is because I've had direct experiences of such things myself, um, that some of which are independently, have been independently um, confirmable. And an example is uh, one of the people who came to visit my mom was the, uh, the rabbi who had died 30 years before, who I grew up with in our synagogue. And he was a lovely guy and they had a really good relationship, but he was coming by a lot and he was sort of boring her, um, which she was a little complained about. Uh, oh. She would complain about. Um, so I came over to visit her one afternoon and I said, uh, any visitors? Because that became, I wanted to know who was showing up. And um, she said, oh, Rabbi Bodenheimer was here. 
I said, oh, did he annoy you? No, he didn't stay long. He had to go greet his sister who was arriving this afternoon. Well, his sister was Mrs. Brown. If she was alive, she'd be over 100. So I didn't take that literally. I, I hung out with my mom and then I went home and got a call from our hometown in Hartford. And uh, Mrs. Brown had died that afternoon at 102 years old. What do you do with that? Um, you know, things like that. So my inclination is to go, okay, this is real. The way my inclination has been, I have experiences in meditation. I never really cared whether I could find a scientific explanation or basis for them. That was completely irrelevant to me. Um, I had those experiences and I had my scientific intellectual experiences. And uh, the fact that they merged as they did in this book was actually a surprise moment to me that I did not seek to happen. And it was a very Zen sort of experience. Um, so what I think is happening, that I can turn to this book and say, how would I incorporate those experiences into this model? Is that this model says the world at its fundamental is nothing but pure awareness, nothing but mind, Again, we have very few English words that are, are good for this. The world is non-material, despite its appearances. And so that opens the possibility for there be, to be other non-material um, realms of existence, planes of existence, that are populated by non-material beings. And one of the things that's been interesting to me in the shamanic stuff I've been exposed to is how my teachers there talk about how um, beings, you know, loosely the astral plane, beings you can encounter on the astral plane, seem dreamlike. They're very hard to grasp in detail, though they're vivid in a sort of experiential way. That to them, we seem dreamlike. And to themselves, they seem solid the way we feel solid to ourselves. Well, my best guess to what's going on is that we know we probably have something in the universe called dark matter. We ah, don't know oh, that's so great, Neil. That was my next question. I just wrote down asking about dark matter and dark energy. Yeah. Uh, uh, dark energy, I don't know what to do with it, but dark matter. Yeah. People do discuss, you know, the it's dark to us, not because it's evil. It's dark to us because we can't experience it through light electromagnetic forces through the strong force through the weak force we can only experience it through gravity and has large-scale gravitational effects on galaxies which is how we know it's probably there but what's it made of there are people who speculate what kind of sub um, quantum level particles would give rise to this large-scale gravitational entity um, but no one really talks about the fact that those should be interactive with each other the way our subatomic particles are interactive with each other so pure awareness gives rise to duality gives rise to space-time gives rise to the quantum foam and is obviously to me also giving rise to the quantum level uh lowest level particles or whatever they are strings whatever of dark matter and those, like our quantum entities, will interact with each other to create some larger scale version of a mass-like object, which then combines further um, because they're interactive with themselves. And interacting things necessarily will combine in a complex system sort of way, give rise to a larger scale thing, which will also be interactive with each other members. And then you get a whole dark matter plane of existence that has no way to interact with us except gravitation or through the experiences of our mind because what do we both have in common us beings and those beings on those planes of existence is the fundamental awareness that we arose from so the idea that we can dip into consciousness to experience them and they can do the same to us and of course we'd appear dreamlike <laughs> um, to each other um, so to me, that's that's a not unreasonable way to discuss things. That's um, very cool. 
when you I, you're the first person I've ever told it to, um, and now it's out there. Um, so I harbor this. The I am going back to work on the book about my mom, and um, your stuff about uh, reincarnation and um, after death stuff is is going to be very useful to me because. Um, her experiences had meaning to her and to us. They were transformative to her and to us. And I want to put those experiences in a context that says to people, hey, I'm a real scientist. I publish work in all the top tier science journals. Um, but I also have these experiences. And I also think that way. Look at the other book. There's no reason to dismiss any of this out of hand. What gets me upset isn't that someone disagrees, it's that they're dismissive. Um, you can't yeah. be dismissive of it and be consistent. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. I mean, I guess uh, one question would be, you know, why, you know, because obviously there are many people who get very old and, you know, have like uh, these care situations. Why have all these types of people, your mother was the one who kind of, you know, had these, uh, you know, kind of semi-conscious or, you know, visit, visitation kind of experiences over the course of years? Is it, uh, you have any... Well, you have... that is indeed a question. So um, there are a couple of things. Um, this was not unusual in her family. There may be a lineage thing. And I've had these experiences. Yeah. When I first told um, one of my mom's friends that she was seeing dead people, she said, your mother's always seen dead people. <laughs> like, excuse me, because she didn't talk to you about it? No. <laughs> um, I had my first experience of something like that when I was like 23, 24. Um, so there may be a lineage thing related to it. Um, one of my shamanic teachers comes from a long line of Scottish witches. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, but my primary teacher in that came out of nowhere. He's just an adept. Yeah, my mom has a deep spiritual practice. Um, her connection to her word, her name for God, is a Yiddish word, the Liba Numa, which means the beloved name. Um, and uh, in her later years, when she would use it, it was like she was a teenage girl talking about her boy crush. And I'd say, you know, how are you and the Liba Numa doing today? And she'd go, oh. We're fine. <laughs> Did her devotional practice open her up to something the way my contemplative practice helps me to open up to a deeper experience? And I make the point in the book that it isn't just contemplative practice. It can be practice of service. It can be practice of devotion. Um, it can be artistic practice. I mean, how do you explain... Um, gay poet. What's that? <laughs> gay poet 19th century help me oscar wilde no 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 new york um uh, hard craze of grass walt, walt whitman walt, walt whitman, whitman. <laughs> aging brain yeah uh, <laughs> uh look walt whitman's walking to me toward me down the street and i can't remember his name <laughs> um where did walt whitman come from his 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 poetry is suffused with insights appropriate to a, a a Zen master. Where did that come from? Um, so I don't know why my mom. But whenever I know someone who has lost somebody, um, I have learned over the years, and, and this started during the AIDS years. My husband and I came of age in New York during the AIDS years. So we were surrounded by dead people all the time. And it became a habit of mine when someone would tell me that someone close to them had died, I said, I would say, have you had any experiences of them? Have they visited? Um, often they'd go, can that happen? <laughs> Some people would go, oh, that doesn't happen. But they all come back to me. Um, I'd say about a third of them reported vivid experiences that, that they could not explain any other way. And some of those are hardcore materialists for whom this is a total mindfuck. Because how do you explain this if materialism is your worldview? Yeah. 
what you were what you were saying before about dark matter. I mean, yeah, you, I wrote about it in that little afterlife book, but I got very fascinated by a few people from the uh, late nineteenth, early twentieth century. One of them being this guy Frederick Myers, who was one of the founders of the Society for Psychic Research. Uh -huh. Oh, sure, um, yeah. And um, so he was writing this book that he that was his magnum opus that was in the end published after he died, called "The Survival of the Human Personality After Bodily Death." Mm -hmm. It was like a you know two thousand page tome or something. <laughs> he and his friends it was, it was, at that point it was a lot of the top scientists in England and like Cambridge people and William James was part of it. So they all were very you know seriously interested in this topic. Then they had some notable mistakes where they like platformed certain like mediums who were then revealed to be frauds, and so they sort of went underground. And they lost a lot of their momentum in a way, but they made a a, a deal like a bet in between the group. Whoever died first would try to come back and communicate from the other side. So I think Myers died around 1900. Mm -hmm. And um, he wasn't that old. I think he was like in his early 50s or something. <clears throat> and then like a year or two later, a number of different mediums uh, spontaneously began to say they were being visited by Myers. And in some cases, his friends gathered together with the psychic and, um, you know, went through these long conversations with Myers who described what life was like for him in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how it's like people have like bodies and they go to the work and they have families. And sometimes it's quite similar. There's different levels depending on, you know, if you're ready to understand that it's really like more like just a consciousness school, then you kind of begin to go up a level. But he also said their, their bodies and everything was made out of a slightly different kind of particle. Uh, mm -hmm. than, uh, what, what, what we have on this side. Yeah. I, I found that, fascinating um it is fascinating and you know i the massive experiences out there i i spend a fair amount of time in the book um towards the end before i get into entertaining um these metaphysical ideas that you have to be really careful when screening the data you're going to include in your theory um because there's a lot of bad data out there too, as there is often in science, right? Um, but if you're really rigorous and you're paying attention to yourself, <laughs> um, things happen. And um, I think to reject them as non-existent because they don't fit your model of understanding of existence is kind of pathetic and certainly not scientific. Right. Well, there's been problems. I'm sure you know Dean Radin's work, right? Um, yeah, I was going to bring him up. So, um, yeah, and and um, someone who I met through him, who worked with him for a while. No, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's written a lovely book on dreams um, and time travel. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, the scientific data is there. And but, I but, heard... But, but I know that... I know they've had an issue with a number of the um, attempts to demonstrate reliably psychic phenomena, but the first time you do an experiment, there's a very strong uh, evidence. Yeah, well, right. But later right. It on, doesn't yeah. seem, yeah, it doesn't okay. seem to follow our normal expectations for yeah. uh, empirical science. The correlate, the correlate drops. So it's almost right. as if the mystery is like protecting itself in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, no, that, that seems to be one of its characteristics. But um, uh, and that's a nice way of, of, you know, <laughs> teleologically what's going on here. Yeah. The mystery is protecting itself. Um, but the, the, it brings up the issue that we're talking about mind experiencing mind, mind impacting on mind, mind studying mind. And so by definition, that can't be empirical science because it's the self examining the self. There's no subject object split, which is how you get empirical science. There's a subject studying an object, and there's a, a space between. Them. And then we find out about placebo effects, and so clinical trials get, get all screwed up. We have to figure some way to make sure they're walled off from each other. Um, but there's never a walling off, really. And this is one of the issues that I bring up in the book. It's, an, it's another core concept. At this level of scale, we're bounded by our skin. Um, at the cellular level, which I'm always looking at, I mean, here's a, this is a liver biopsy. See okay. this yeah. um, So I spend half a day every day looking at bodies made of cells. 
And at the cellular level, where's your boundary? Well, we know that 50%, roughly 50% of the cells of your living body, which without which you cannot be a living human, are the microbiome, the bacteria and a few other things that populate all the surfaces of your body and all the internal crevices. And we leave that everywhere, including on each other. So that if you have a household, if you go look at the microbiome in the household, everybody shares one single large microbiome, including the pets who live in the house. And so where's your boundary at the cellular level? Well, it's out here somewhere. Um, if you want to talk human cells, well, the dust in your room is the shedding of your skin cells. Where is your boundary? Just take it's where you live, where you exist. If you go down to the molecular level, cells cease to exist as independent, reifiable things. That's the end of Western medicine and Western biology, because that's based on cell doctrine. If you think of bodies as made of fluids in which you have you know, aqueous solutions of molecules floating around, interacting with each other as a complex system. Um, simplest example is we breathe out CO2 for the plants and the plants breathe out oxygen for us. At the molecular level, we are seamlessly intertwined with the entire biomass of the plant. At the atomic level, there isn't an atom in our bodies that we didn't breathe, eat, or drink from the plant. So on the one hand, we can think of ourselves as lonely, anxious creatures wandering around on this rock we call planet Earth. Or you can think about it as the atomic mass of the planet taking three and a half billion years to self-organize themselves into creatures that think they're alone and anxious. And both of those are equally true. It's like wave particle duality in quantum physics. And we talk about it as complementarity. And Niels Bohr actually said complementarity was a universal principle, not just at the quantum realm. And then you get, so, you know, what's your boundary at the atomic level? The entire planet. Well, then you're down in the quantum realm and we know, we won a Nobel Prize, we have non-locality and entanglement. So at the quantum level, where's your boundary? It's the entire universe. So... There's no way to design any scientific experiment in which you, in fact, are truly separate from the object you are studying, because at some level of scale, you are intimately intertwined with. We use an image in one of the papers, that um, Sentience Everywhere paper, I think. Um, we have a picture of this entomologist studying an ant colony, and that's empirical science. It's the entomologist studying the ant colony. But there's an ecologist standing way back over there who's like, there's a human who's walked into my ecosystem and is fucking it up. You're interfering with my experiment. There's never a true way to get that separation. Um, modern science hasn't come to grips with that. Um, this is, you know, and using quantum physics as the prime example, the double slit experiment and how conscious observation changes whether things behave as particles or waves. That's the part of the book that people really dismiss me for. You don't understand quantum physics. Um, we've moved past Copenhagen interpretation. Well, not the physics physicists I work with. Um, but the other part of this argument is Kurt Gödel and Gödel's incompleteness theory. So the idea of what's the best way to understand the nature of existence in our culture, what we say is empirical science, and we also say formal mathematics. Those are the two pillars. Those are the two lenses through which we should be able to explain and describe all existence. So we already know from quantum physics and complexity theory that empirical science is fuzzier, and you can't get out of the human intention of how you're doing the study. On the mathematical side, well, formal logic, formal mathematics should be able to take care of that. And so in order for that to be true, every theorem about mathematics should be provable from some other theorems that eventually are provable all the way from the, you know, from some basic axioms. Um, an axiom, the axiom of identity, A equals A. One thing is equal to itself always. Um, and you build up these proofs ever more complex. 
around the the early century, um, a big issue in mathematics was we have to prove, in fact, that you can prove all of mathematics, that it is provable um, in a complete sort of way. Everything can be completely understood. And when you do that, it would be completely consistent with itself. There could be no contradictions because if you put a contradiction in a proof, it opens up the possibility of, of chaos. You can prove anything once you have a contradiction. So people were looking to see how to prove that. And this fellow named Kurt Gödel, um, probably the greatest logician ever, um, the guy who used to walk with Einstein in Einstein's last years at, at Princeton, at the Institute for Advanced Study. He's kind of, that's how people know him. He appears in Oppenheimer in the distance. Um, he actually proved through a remarkable kind of way, which I try and summarize in the book, it's pretty hard, um, that if you have a system of mathematics that is that includes arithmetic, numbers, real numbers, that if you develop a complete proof of all of it, it will necessarily be inconsistent and contain contradictions. If you develop a proof that is completely consistent, and this is the key thing. There will always be true statements about the system that cannot be proven from within the system. So how can you know something's true and yet you can't prove it? Through intuition, through the mind. And that opens, and Gödel himself acknowledged that that opens the door back to metaphysics. That mathematics is not sufficient to understand everything in existence and describe everything in existence. And in fact, we know specifically there are things that cannot be proven that are true. So empirical science isn't complete um, and doesn't get us all the way there to understand reality. Mathematics doesn't. Intuition is necessary. And what kind of intuition? Well, we turned, as I said, to the contemplatives who are adepts and experts at the mind examining itself, which by definition cannot be empirical science because there's no separation. It's your own mind investigating your own mind. And what's found there, kind of universally, although how it's described or what its, its import may be, um, is that there is a big C consciousness that underlies everything, idealism. It all leads to the same place. Yeah. And that's contemporary Western, modern physics, mathematics, science, philosophy. Um, but materialists have a hard time. Yeah, and, and obviously a lot of our institutions are, are still very much... Um, rooted in in a reductive materialism or physicalist uh, worldview yeah, yeah. and all, mean, our, all of these tech billionaires you know who are control a lot of our public discourse they also seem to be locked into a materialist understanding yeah. well I, I wrote a paper with a, a writer friend of mine um about mars <laughs> colonizing mars yeah. um you know at the quantum level the electric nature, the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic nature of our bodies, which is fundamental to its physio physiology at the molecular level, at the cellular level, at the organ level. How does your heart beat? <laughs> it's electromagnetism. Um, how does the liver process stuff? There's little electrical waves traveling through the liver at microscopic scale. So it's important. And it developed entirely within the Earth's electromagnetic field. They are not separate from each other. Now, what happens if you take human cells and you put them in a world that has no electromagnetic field, like Mars? Well, you can expect there to be some problems, both in the functioning of the physiological organism, but let's get really fundamental. Can you have reproduction? Would a sperm and an egg develop normally in the absence of a magnetic field? And there are a few experiments out there that have been done, which indicate that, no, this is a real problem. So maybe we can get to Mars, but we can't make babies there. 
or we can't make living things that are humans like us. Maybe they are beings that would self-organize into things that are like humans, but have a different physiology and they'd be true Martians because they can only exist in a Martian environment. Although I think it more likely that they, there would be a miscarriage <laughs> that the organism would survive. I kind of, I kind of want to get to a point that I feel like in my mind, I have kind of like, maybe it's a little bit inchoate, but I have this idea that I'm like pushing towards and I, and I feel like I'm not really, you know, I, I want to just, maybe I just uh, blunder it out and then okay. we can get back from it. Okay. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm doing this course and, and actually I think, you know, if you want to speak on it, it would be great to have you. Uh, we're doing, I mean, I'm doing a couple of up upcoming seminars. We discussed a little bit and I think you'd be a great voice on both of them. One of them, the one that's coming up next month is called Embracing Our Emergency. Right. I've seen uh, it. So we're, yeah. so we're looking at, um, you know, I, I guess in a way I'm trying to find a seam of hope in, in the climate catastrophe. And um, I have to be completely honest that the more that I've looked like I, fo I follow a lot of different climate scientists on, uh, you know, what used to be Twitter, which is now X. And the ones who are credible are, uh, you know, in a state of uh, grief at this point. Yeah. Uh, you know, what happened in the last year was, you know, we've gone up to like, you know, 1.7 or even two above pre-industrial and, you know, I, I was, I've been like, you know, in my work screaming about this, even though it wasn't really my bailiwick, you know, since my first book came out back in 2002. Right, right, right. And, um, you know, I felt very scared that, uh, or concerned, let's say, that we weren't going to make a shift in time. And now it feels that we haven't made a shift in time. And, it, you know, it, it might be the case that we're already too late even to prevent our own extinction, um, which is what some of these, some of these think people well, think. Yeah, I, I, I would just say humans are so adaptable, barring some something that could literally kill off every single human without the chance to adapt, like a pan-human infection, although we've never seen such a thing. Um, there's always someone who's immune. Um, big radiation blast <laughs> that wipes out everybody. Humans aren't going to go extinct. Our civilization will go extinct. Yeah. But humans will find pockets and start reproducing and they'll self-organize into little societies. It might. And, yeah. I, I guess the question would be the um, the oxygen, right? Because like, um, you know, it's the idea of the methane stored under the Arctic and the Siberian. So if that is if that is start, starting to thaw and erupt into the atmosphere, then you go into a situation where it's 10 degrees Celsius in a couple of decades that it goes up. And the and problem is that the plankton provides like 60% of our oxygen and the tropical forests, maybe like oh, 3%. That could be an extinction event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I did, and no one ever, no one ever tied that together with me. Yeah. Um, do you, do you want to know where I go with this? <laughs> What's that? Oh, you froze. You want to know where I go with this? Yeah. Um, no, 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 but I, I still have a thing that I'm trying to get oh, to. Oh, yeah. Go, go to your inchoate thing that you're going to. Okay. Um, you know, but at the same time that we have seems to maybe, you know, maybe not pushed ourselves over the edge where we've um, undone our, you know, physical systems to the point where we really don't have a fix it. Uh, we've also discovered, you know, which the Tibetan Buddhists understood or the Shaviite, you know, the Kashmiri, you know, Shaviites understood that consciousness is actually the foundational reality. And the universe is actually kind of like ultimately made of, made of magic. That it's a kind of psychic manifestation. It's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 And what, I, what I've been saying for many years. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, is there then an opportunity in this last stage? Let's say we let's say we did have 20 years. You know, would it be is, is there an idea or a possibility that we could put all this stuff together into some kind of like super laboratory of the psyche, let's say, where we um, you know, kind of tra entrained people in like a whole new discourse, uh, paradigm. Uh, I mean, I'm very interested also in like Rupert Sheldrake's uh, mm -hmm. ideas around morphic residence and yeah, morphic yeah, yeah. fields and kind of, because if you visit different indigenous cultures, like in the Amazon, things, you know, like the Kogi, like magical things happen that are understood in their construct, in their language, in their myth. Uh, it's, ju it's just a whole way of being. It's like a woven reality that has different uh, pos potentialities than ours, yeah. than ours does. And, and is that possible that that could happen on a global civilizational scale that would be transformative and rescue us from the horror? 
Yes, or rescue us from the horror, or maybe, maybe it's the doorway to something else. Maybe, maybe well, that's it. And, 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 and some, the doorway to something like else may include the, an extinction event. Right, but um, so so one of the things about one of the implications of a complexity understanding of systems is that necessarily, given enough time, every complex living system will suffer a mass extinction event, either partial or complete. And that's inherent in the mathematics and it's unavoidable. Um, and it derives from the way interacting elements of a system uh, adapt and evolve is that there's a low level randomness in every complex system, in every living thing. So, and this is at the universe scale. Um, that limited randomness are the rules of quantum mechanics at the quantum level. It's the rules of electron shells and chemistry at the, you know, not everything can't happen. Very specific things can. Um, there's a limited randomness. Too much randomness, you get no self-organization. Too little randomness, the thing becomes a machine and always does the same thing. And when the environment changes, there's no way to adapt. And so it dies that way. So you need this little bit of randomness. So in every moment, what the next moment of the system will be is randomly determined. It's stochastic. You can't predict what the next moment will be. You can predict the size and range of potentials around it. Stu Kaufman, uh, one of my teachers and one of the founders of complexity theory, called these the adjacent possibles. In every moment, there's not, a not infinite array of adjacent possibles for the next moment. So what we're hoping is there's an adjacent possible that includes some aspect of human survival and maybe a range of adjacent possibles that even, you know, might uh, save a bunch, but a large bunch. But mass extinction events also inevitably happen. And that's independent of what we're doing to some extent. Um, we can influence it. We can possibly mitigate it. We can possibly, um, maybe in some cir circumstances, we can actually prevent it. And by and large, um, a way to consider how to do that is looking at the other principles of how complex systems self-organize, because you can play with those to get different outcomes. And, uh, you know, that's in the book, too. That's also not exactly what I'm talking about here. It's almost no, like... No, I know, I know, I know. I'm good. <laughs> now, what happens when you put this in the context of a non-material universe that's made of mind? From that perspective, you know, um, there are the blood vessels in our body formed as solid cords, and then the cells within their centers suffer programmed cell death and a massive die-off. And now you've got hollow tubes that can act as a cardiovascular system. So a mass extinction event was necessary for the life of the organism. What's the organism we're talking about? The anxiety to some extent comes, and you know, I don't, this is not a way for me to shed this anxiety by any means. But if we're talking about individual humans as the unit, well, a lot of people have a lot of trouble coming. If you think of civilization as the unit, some parts of it are probably in trouble. Some parts of it are already in trouble. But maybe that's going to be a partial mass extinction and civilization will morph itself. But if you're thinking about the global consciousness of everything alive on Earth, Gaia, um, well, maybe that's the thing that we should be looking at. And this is all just sort of, yeah, fine, we have... Uh, you know, it gets so warm, we have no plankton, we have no oxygen, the mammals die off, um, but there's a whole bunch of other life on the on Earth that's going to survive. And the dinosaur die off, it was the small little mammals that none of the dinosaurs were probably noticing. Um, and they turned into us. Life continues. What it will continue to become will be ever more complex because that's also the nature of complex systems. And in that sense... The universe is alive in its entirety. It is conscious in its entirety. And where we 
grasp to defines to some extent the nature of the suffering we experience within them. Now, there's no way for me to completely let go into some sort of enlightened experience of nirvana where I'm just one with the, the, the big C consciousness, and so I'm untouched by suffering. But that's not like it. Um, but where I go in the last paragraphs of the book, my family, you know, my grandparents were killed in the Holocaust. And as I said before, my husband and I came of age in New York City during a play. And what I saw is that there were people who were broken by the experiences and survivors who were broken and survivors who whose lives were richer and more connected. Um, from having survived the experience. And people who didn't make it, um, I saw people on their deathbeds die in fear, anger, despair. But I also saw people on their deathbeds who were taking care of everyone in the room around them who were already grieving. And, um, and the dying person, and my mother wound up like this, um, was in kind of a bliss state. So what we can learn from this is the resilience comes from understanding that all of these things are happening at all these levels of scale. And if we latch on to any single level of scale, we're going to be missing something of impact. Um, it's just as inappropriate to latch on to my own existence as the only thing I worry about in the middle of this, which is what a lot of people are doing, right? Just, you know, will I have enough stuff to survive the apocalypse? Um, then there are people who are worrying about their cities, and then there are people like you who are wonder worrying in part, it's only a piece of what you do, about global human culture. But there's also the even larger, more fundamental thing of what's going on in this corner of the vast mind that is everything that's just consciousness and an evolution of it. Um, so it's, 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 I, I think the key thing is there are two things. Number one is to always have the flexibility to remember there are other levels of scale from which this needs to be observed to have an understanding of what's going on. Sure. None of them are more important than any other. Every single one is as valid and important as every other one. And if you ignore one, you ignore one at your peril. Um, but the other thing is, my grandparents were killed in Riga. That's where the German Jews mostly were sent to die. And um, I found... I went to Riga and turned out I could find out enormous detail about what happened to my grandparents when they arrived there. Um, now, my mom, my grandmom had two sons. My father was sent to England on the kinder transport five days before the war started. So they sent him away, never saw him again. My grandfather wanted to send my uncle, my, my father's older brother, who couldn't go, was too old for the kinder transport, to Amsterdam but my grandmother couldn't bear to send her other son away. So he went to Riga with them. I talked to my uncle about this and he said, well, had she sent me to Amsterdam, I would have been sent to Auschwitz and I would have died. In Riga, I was put in a work camp and I had a chance to survive. She was shot in a forest. Um, and when I found the spot, I sort of, uh, <laughs> there's a ghost part of this story, which I could tell you some other time. But the experience I had was, oh, I finally really have met my grandmother. I know who she was. And I know who she was at the moment she was dying. And she was a woman who was dying in despair because she had sent both her sons away. She lost her husband. She had failed in every choice she had made. And I think that's the state of mind she met her death with. But the fact is she was the only one of her siblings and cousins who actually saved both her children. 
So we do what we have to do. You have to show up the way you show up. <laughs> um, it's necessary. But even if bad things happen and you see them fail, you can't assume that things fail. You can't assume that you fail. Um, the solace here is we can't ever know the ends of what we do. And even if we don't survive, um, what we do matters. And any small thing can tip the balance. And you may be the source of tipping that balance, even if you're not here to see that and understand. It. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind too. All of this stuff, I think if you leave out any piece of this, um, this doesn't solve my anxiety and it doesn't solve my despair, but it gives me a little perspective on it. Um, well, I, guess, I, guess, I guess like I'm, you know, a lot of people in the activist world are still focused on, you know, um, fighting the corporations, you know, holding on. Um, but actually, I think it would be kind of interesting in a way to have you in dialogue with somebody like Bill McCann, but I don't know if you talked to him. No, uh, I haven't, what, but sure. <laughs> whether this type of uh, perspective um, gives him another angle on, on you know, because, he, he, I mean, uh, we're also having this guy, Nate Hagens, uh, who has a... Uh, uh, video series and podcast, The Great Simplification, which is very good. I, I, I've it, I've heard it has reached my ears, but yeah. Yeah. but um, I guess I guess what I'm thinking about is like uh, kind of like if somebody was to give me like a hundred million dollars or something, it'd be like some kind of like super institute for developing the psyche uh, or exploring. Like there's a guy Tom Roberts wrote a book called The Psychedelic like Future of the Mind, and he was talking about these different uh, mind body states and how people have different seem to have different abilities, you know, then you have like Tibetan Buddhists who, you know, go into the rainbow body where they're, yeah, where they're yeah, yeah. all dis dis you know, dissolve uh, kind of into rainbows or uh, don't George decay. Harrison, when he died. What's that? I mean, his rainbow body. Yeah. If you look at the uh, Scorsese documentary at the very, very, very end, his rainbow body appeared. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 That I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, just watch the last five minutes. Interesting. Or yeah, I mean the um, the Taoists are able to like push people across, you know, the room with with just the energy oh, of their chi. I was doing Tai Chi for a while, and my Tai Chi instructor was one of those. I mean, yeah. I'm here, he doesn't move, and suddenly I'm thrown thirty feet back, and we'd always have to have someone to catch you at the other side because otherwise you'd hit the wall, hit the desk, etc. Yeah. Um. I'm just wondering if in this type of realm, you know, the shamanic realm and these types of um, esoteric realms, maybe there's something else that self-organizes uh, that even if we lose, you know, kind of the the the, the um, organic realm, there's like, you know, it's not just a technological thing. It's it's right. like a right. Into, uh, right. The psychic realm or something like that. You know? Yeah, and but but can we ever know that and define it? Probably not, um, or at least not as while we're you know, unskilled and attached to our human forms. But um, we don't know shit about what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't. Um, I follow a lot about what you talk about in terms of civilizational cycles and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even giving that all credence, we don't know what that's about. <laughs> we just can recognize, oh, there are cycles. How do the people who recognize those experience them? That's an interesting question because I don't think they're making it up. I don't think it's an imaginational thing. I think it's an experiential thing. Yeah. Um, well, how, how do you think that sort of integrating uh, this idealism into like cellular biology and a molecular and atomic levels, you know, it's kind of this multi holonic kind of like viewpoint what what's what's the potentially positive impact that could have on um kind of the future of uh you know culture the future of science like where where, where could it take us if we, if enough people kind of anchor this this whole this new level of uh perspective in a way well um that's another thing i'm working on um so 
a few years ago, my other viral science stuff was the idea that the interstitium of the human body, um, which is basically all the co collagen-rich connective tissue of the body, which is a single body-wide network, has these fluid-filled spaces in it. Um, and uh, it's called the interstitium. And um, when we published it, there was a lot of news and fuss that this was a new organ. I think it's actually a new organ system. I think it's a level of scale up. And <clears throat> when you're considering what's going on here, you're talking about what's going on at the molecular and the fluid level of the body. Um, and so part of one of the limitations in Western science, it's what I mentioned earlier, Western science and biology is defined by cell doctrine. When we looked under the microscope, we saw empty boxes. Um, they were called cells because they were like the cell of a monk or a prisoner devoid of furniture. And you couldn't take an empty box and break it into smaller boxes. You just get fragments. And so the cell was the unit of life. And that's Western medicine and Western biology. But what about all the stuff that's between the cells? you can think of the body as a, a fluid, and at which point cells as an independent existing thing disappear. I think this is chapter five of the book. Um, so the body is fluid. Um, <clears throat> the body has an electromagnetic body. It turns out that all this collagen probably is a giant piezo crystal. And every time any piece of you moves, you're generating electrical current independent of your nervous system. And is that where, you know, are the overlapping structures within that electromagnetic field your chakras? When I um, published this stuff, uh, there was initially a fair amount of anger from, for example, the osteopaths, uh, people who do rolfing, cranial sacral work, um, the fascia researchers on the planet, because they were like, this is not new. We've known this for 60 or 70 years. I wasn't aware that they knew this because I was looking in the medical literature, which excludes them. So I never saw it. But now I found out about it. When I was in China for liver thing, um, they asked me to give a talk on the interstitium, and I did. And the first um, question was from someone who was attending who was very high up in their version of NIH for traditional Chinese medicine. And he said, what's been the reaction? He asked, what's the reaction been to this work? And I said, well, you know, it's anatomy. It's hard to ignore. So once people see it, they know it's real. Um, but there was a lot of anger because people said, we've known this for 60 or 70 years. And he laughed and said, yes, and we've known about it for 4,000. Yeah. Um, so this complexity view allows you to open up that the body is functioning at all these levels of scale. And if you just lock in at one single level, you're missing all the others. And different cultures of healing and health are tapping into different levels of scale. None of them do all of it. And it's that same complementarity. None of them can do all of it, nor should we expect any one model to do everything. But there are modes of healing, and then we go down to the conscious level. And we know that the mind can do all sorts of astonishing things in terms of healing the body, whether it's your own body or someone else's body. That happens too. It's documented, you know. If you think the body is made of cells and that's all there is, there's no room to accept that as truth. So you reject it as data. But if you understand that everything is just a field of consciousness, then sure, why not? So both the interstitium stuff I've been doing, um, which people from all sorts of different cultures look at and go, yes, that's what we've been talking about. Um, and the complexity stuff, I think just open up a common language for shamanic practices, for Chinese, Tibetan, Japanese practices, Native American, uh, old Swedish, <laughs> um, who are all considering the body from a different perspective. These are all complementary to each other. And if we can find complementary, if we can understand each other's languages, which is what 
to bring things kind of full circle. When Jane, the artist, and Neil, the scientist, sat down to talk, the first step of an interdisciplinary collaboration was to learn each other's languages. Not necessarily well enough to speak them, but at least to understand them. And if these ideas, this anatomy, this science, provide a field in which people can learn to communicate with each other, I think it'll transform everything. The question is, will it happen in time? Well, I guess I'll be one last question for you, and then maybe we'll leave it for today. But I mean, um, you know, of uh, of this whole theory, I do feel there's like, I felt buoyed up, I kind of excited. I felt as, as I've been marinating in this whole climate catastrophe, and I was trying to articulate one element where I felt maybe there's some trajectory or some possibility that suggests that. But I'm curious, from your perspective, um, like, you know, if you were to talk to somebody like... Um, you know, Nate or Bill McKibben or somebody who's really been, you know, mired into how, you know, we've overshot, you know, our, our possibility mm -hmm. of changing the system, intervening, you know, wh wh where do you see what you're talking about in terms of complementarity and uh, idealism could actually give them like a new orientation or, or something that would be useful and helpful? So on the one hand, there's this grim notion of mass extinction <laughs> events that are unavoidable. But which mass extinction events happen? That's an open question. Um, the next moment of existence is determined by the range of adjacent possibles in this moment. This is how I cope with American politics. <laughs> I don't know the full range of adjacent possibles, but I'm sure some of them aren't terrible. There are things we can't imagine happening. Th this is, I mean, this is usually what happens. We're looking over here and something happens over here. Uh, John Lennon's, you know, life is what's happening when you're, I can't the remember. other plans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. While you're making, yeah. Um, so the fact is that there's always this range of possibilities that the universe is generating and some share of those are creative and adaptive rather than mass extinction oriented. In fact, the majority of them might be. And how do you know that? Because life flourishes. Wherever life is, life flourishes. The universe flourishes. It doesn't always work out. Right. But you can't assume it's not. There's always a possibility out there before the next moment arrives that changes everything. Even when the physics seems slightly incontrovertible or like hard to, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, let's let's play wild science fiction, uh, you know, yeah. just because I have to come up with something for you. Because yeah. if I could predict what it if I could predict what that adjacent possible was, we'd all be working towards it, right? Um, maybe there's someone working on something that draws methane and carbon from the universe from the, the atmosphere in a really efficient way that's low energy and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. We don't, you know, is it likely? No. Um, will sentient beings from another planetary system come and go, you know, we solved this problem a long time ago and here's some help. I can imagine possibilities that can happen. Now the two I come up with are highly unlikely. But I can't imagine the likely, me personally, yeah. I can't imagine the likely ones because if I could, I'd be telling you what they are. <laughs> but someone may be, and you may not even know you're doing it because it may be something that arises out of collective activity as an unpredictable emergent phenomenon. And every single member of the system helped make that moment possible. So I think you just have to keep going. You can't know. You can't know we can escape it. But you can be pretty certain that there are possibilities for mitigating. And right. it may be that you can't predict where they're going to come from. So just keep going. All right, Neil. Very cool. Wonderful to talk to you. I love the book. And I love that you're uh, transmitting this uh, way of thinking and, 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 and knowing and sensing to the world. Uh, I, I I can't tell you how 
you in particular telling me that has meaning for me. Oh, <laughs> so I really appreciate that. Good to hear. Yeah. Um, but let's uh, let's get you involved in these other seminars uh, if that if that works for you. Uh, yeah, time. of course. And um, yeah, really great to reconnect and uh, more to come. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank have, you. Have a beautiful day.